Yeah, so we are going to get into cryonics a little bit. It's good to see, um, we actually have quite a few people here working on cryopreservation, so it's been good to see. Um, you know, growing up, and I'll just say quickly, you know, growing up in a Mormon family, Mormon family, in the middle of Utah, um, it was very, uh, it was taboo to even be looking at and, and thinking about solving a lot of the problems that we've talked about today. Um, so being able to just be in a room of a bunch of people who are very serious about solving these problems is, um, I mean, it's awesome, right? Like it was very alienating as a kid growing up and talking about cryonics and, and anti-aging to my Mormon parents and <laughs> not getting the, 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 you know, the response I was hoping for. But um, yeah, no, this is, uh, this is awesome. So thank you for having me and, and, and uh, I'm glad we can uh, all be here today to try to figure out how we, we solve these problems. Um, that being said, um, I think for probably most people in this room, cryonics is still seen as a plan B. Um, and I think you guys are out of your minds. So that's what I'm here to uh, uh, you know, talk about a little bit. Um, I, I, I think uh, if, if, if the, the reason I chose this topic in specific, because obviously I mean, with, with, with any, any of our fields, there's a ton of challenges we can choose from. Um, and then, you know, cryonics is no different. There's a lot of challenges we need to solve. Um, but if I'm, if I'm thinking of a, a future that I want, um, I like to think of a future where, uh, you know, in, instead of burning or, or burying, you know, consciousness that, that has taken billions of years of stars colliding to form, you know, uh, you know what we do, uh, the way we treat death, in, in my opinion, is just is wrong. I think, um, you know, you, 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 you could compare, you know, death to, you uh, the burning of a, an entire library. I mean, these are, these are memories and, and personalities and experiences that we're just never gonna be able to get back. And that's why this work is, is so important. And um, I think the, the problem with calling cryonics a plan B is that you're almost implying that if we solve plan A, we won't need plan B. And the fact of the matter is, if you're living an extended lifespan, uh, a radically extended lifespan, or if, if you want to get to the point where uh, uh, you're living indefinitely, and we can, you know, hopefully in the future, choose when we want to die if that day comes. Um, there, the the, I mean, s survival is a game of probability, and the fact of the matter is, those probabilities are just going to catch up with you. So, a, you know, you're betting on the fact that we do reverse aging in our lifetimes, or at least hit LEV, right? Which is um, uh, you know, that's, that's the first bet you're making. But the other bet you're making, uh, if you're not focusing on chronics, is um, that uh, you're not going to run into any other problem that causes death. And the, there's an overwhelming list of these, right? I mean, uh, everything from whether it's environmental, whether it's accidental death, uh, whether it's uh, a, another pandemic that hits us in 100 years, or it's one of these crackheads outside that stabs you for no reason. The fact of the matter is there's a lot of ways we can die. And uh, I believe that um, in a future where we do have radically extended lifespans, you are going to have to go into cryostasis at some point. Uh, I think that's just where the probability is. So I think it's very important to uh, focus on this alongside longevity research. But um, you know, maybe maybe Plan B, as in focusing on it after when things aren't working out, is probably the wrong approach. Um, so when I was entering this field, I wanted to. Uh, my goal was to figure out how we can get cryonics in the hospitals one day. Um, I believe there will be a very large growth curve for cryonics eventually, and I believe the way we get there is, I think, I think the point in time it will happen is when people wouldn't dare go to a hospital without cryopreservation procedures in place, because why would you dare risk permanent death, right? So I believe that's, that's what the future looks like. So if we... Go ahead and scroll down here. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why cryonics in hospitals would be good. Um, legitimacy 
if we can uh, no longer be the weird buildings at the middle of nowhere that are performing these procedures. Uh, I think it's very important that these are done by trained doctors, um, uh, that this will bring more research, funding, support, uh, and, and just a lot more legitimacy to the, to the space. Um, uh, we, we can you know, remove the, the, the delay between uh, people dying and actually getting them cryopreserved. So, um, I mean, this is, you know, this is difficult in humans. Uh, there's, there's only a handful of cryonic facilities around the, uh, around the world right now. And um, if you live near one of them and you are lucky enough to have uh, uh, a death that we knew was coming, then maybe you can get a decent preservation. But uh, in, in a lot of the cases, um, you know, there's a, there's a very long delay between getting people uh, from when they're legally dead to getting uh, cryopreserved. So this this uh, this is sort of the field problem where you can't have that lab quality cryopreservation that that would be uh, much much better for revival. Uh, and then of course we can get around. Uh, you know, there's there's still legal hurdles that we have to get through, especially when it comes to humans. And uh, if if we're working directly with hospitals, then we can overcome a lot of these. Um, uh, so yeah, I believe that at least for, you know, to start, you know, cryopreservation should be a standard option so people can have the uh, choice of, of being cryopreserved instead of um, just the standard options right now that are, that are presented. Um, now, uh, <laughs> this is, this is uh, difficult to do. And if I knew we were voting on um, uh, these, I probably would have spent a little more time on this slide. But uh, yeah, this is, this, is, this is very difficult to do. I mean, right now, if you walk into a hospital and you ask them to start doing uh, cryonics, it's, it's, it's very likely not going to happen. Uh, some are more open than others, um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're still very early in this. So uh, our choice was to start with these guys right here and some others, uh, essentially to start with animal hospitals, um, which, which generally are uh, open to cryonics, it's it's simply it's not going to be an easy path, but it's definitely a lot more doable than human hospitals. And I was kind of racking my brain because I was like, okay, how do we get the first the first animal hospital? How do I how do I just get that first animal hospital to agree to do cryonics? How could we get past that uh, point? And the easiest way to do that uh, uh, was and I'll get to that next, but was to be the animal hospital ourselves because it's pretty it's it's pretty easy to convince ourselves to do something right. So essentially, what we're building is uh, basically half animal hospital and half cryonics facility. So uh, we'll be doing both of these under the same roof to uh, essentially prove that when cryonics is presented in the right way. Um, by uh, an actual animal doctor, uh, if it, when, when it's not just this random building in the middle of the desert, uh, when, when, when this is um, actually happening under, under uh, the roof of an animal hospital, that uh, more people will actually opt in and, and uh, choose to, to undergo this process for their pet. Um, you know, sentiment for cryonics isn't, uh, it's actually, not as bad as you'd think. And I, th I think Emil actually in 2021 did a, 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 a poll or a survey on this and actually found that most people are actually very, very open to the idea of cryonics. Um, so sentiment isn't necessarily the, the main issue. And of course, we, you know, we can make improvements there. But I think just uh, having this presented in the right way um, and, and, and being an option directly in the hospital will be extremely uh, effective for, for getting people to actually opt into this. Um, pets are ideal for a number of reasons. Uh, you can go directly from euthanasia to cryopreservation in most cases. Um, you, you know, with, with, with pets, you can usually uh, see when they're getting towards the end of their life, and then it's, it's the humane option to, to euthanize them. And that, that basically gives us the opportunity to get closer to those lab quality cryopreservations that would be uh, amazing for, for humans, which we hope to get to eventually. Um, uh, the cost is, of course, very much reduced. We can avoid all those legal hurdles that we have to deal with with humans. Um, uh, I, I see it as sort of a gateway drug to humans, where if, if people start doing this for their animals, that uh, they start thinking, well, you know, maybe uh, in the future, 
this is something that we can do for ourselves and um, uh, research is, is a bit easier and then uh, we, we you know can even save endangered species which is kind of a side quest but uh, I think is also really important and, and cool work um, so uh, and it, it, essentially you know once once we can prove that under the right circumstances enough people will opt into this process um, we can basically get this around the country so the idea is to train veterinary clinics across the country uh, at, at the very minimum. Uh, an ideal number would be one in each state. And uh, the, the, the future would be basically a, a pet owner in, uh, you know, Maryland or in Texas could go to, uh, you know, a, a veterinary clinic or, or an animal hospital that's relatively close to them, something that's local, if they have to have their pet euthanized. Um, and they'll be able to opt in to this process. They'll be able to opt in to cryonics. And uh, then those pets would be transferred to our facility. And then uh, that's, that's where they would be stored. So um, it's, it's a way that we can, we can really reach the country. Um, and then, of course, uh, once this is, once, once we do this for, animal hospitals and this starts spreading through animal hospitals, uh, I see that as the way that we can uh, basically repeat that process for humans. And I believe that this is the best way that we can really target the death problem. Because I mean, I think um, cryonics is really the only technology that directly targets death at its core. Um, and that's why, that's why I decided to work on it. So uh, thank you, that's, that's it. working first? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, it would obviously be ideal if we can um, have revival prior to this, right? Uh, it's, it's very likely not going to be the case. Um, there's, there's lower hanging fruit. I mean, you know, some of the, some of the even the study that you know, Natasha Vitamora did with uh, preserving the memory of, of C. elegans through cryopreservation is, um, uh, it, it, it's, uh, impressive, right? And and of course we want to um, repeat that process in a mammal. Uh, I think the first studies that uh, we'll see that sort of uh, get us closer are um, not necessarily, you know, cryopreserving a mouse or a hamster down to negative 196 and and reviving them. But uh, if if we can if we can do, you know, um, uh, 50, 60 percent of the brain um, uh, reverse it revive that, that uh, hamster, mouse, and then uh, prove that the uh, memory is still there, send them back through the maze, right? Um, I think that would be really impactful as far as uh, 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 this, this um, sentiment and, and getting people more interested in it. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I obviously getting to revival is incredibly important. and. I don't think we should be sitting around and, and praying for nanotechnology. I think we need to get these preservation methods innately reversible for a, for a big part of it. And and uh, um, yeah, I don't I don't think that's out of reach in our lifetimes. Any but, means. but what I mean is, my my question was for your personal efforts mm -hmm. uh, in terms of order of operations. Do you think you should focus full on and getting revivals to work from a scientific perspective, or would, would you intend other other? Uh, um, or would you intend to to spend your efforts um, building a business around, um, you know, one way priorities? Well, it's so it's it's a little of both, right? So we are, um, I mean, we're a for profit, so we're not conducting basic research. Uh, we are conducting research on making the procedures better and improving those procedures. Um, so uh, as far as um, uh, I guess your question is, would it be better to focus on? Well, actually, I wasn't trying to evaluate, like, place a value on it. It was just sure. a personal question for you. You're planning to launch headlong into a one-way prior business. Do you think you should focus on that or do you think that you should focus on something else? Like, you know, is it better to focus on so many hands. Okay, maybe we can take like one more. Uh, Who hasn't said anything? I'm curious if you have a sense of what kind of price point you can set. Obviously, animals vary tremendously in size, but you know, let's take a cat for example. Yeah. So um, 
yeah, I have a 10 year old cat. So that one's very uh, important to me as far as this research goes. Um, yeah, so they, you know, it, it, it varies. Animals vary in, in size quite a bit. I've gotten requests for um, horses and I've gotten requests for uh, hamsters. I had, I had, I had a girl uh, uh, drunk text me uh, that she was she was crying because she didn't want her hamster to die and was freaking out and was like please like what can we do about this um, so I've, I've yeah I mean, people love their pets and I and I, I absolutely am, I'm right there with them so um, yeah as, as, as far as a uh, you know we, we obviously this isn't locked down yet but um, I'm very much only interested in the best technology that we can offer here uh, I, I, I believe that uh, I think this, the CI does offer uh, some uh, some work on pets. I, I, I think they get the price fairly low because in most cases they just do a straight freeze. Um, I'm very much interested in the highest quality preservation that we can possibly get. For a, for a cat, um, it'll probably be, uh, and the size still varies, but probably be around the $10,000 uh, range. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of factors. And of course, at scale, this price can go down tremendously. Um, but it, to start, it'd probably be in that range. So. As Alex spoke this morning, cryotonic ice formation, has that been resolved? I mean, isn't that a major, major issue? Well, yeah, I mean, as far as ice formation, I mean, you know, back in the 80s, uh, vitrification was, was introduced, uh, I believe by Greg Fay for the most part, um, where, where essentially you perfuse the organ or the body with cryoprotectants and then uh, you vitrify them and, instead of freezing them. So uh, obviously this isn't a perfect process by any means and the cryoprotectants still cause damage, but um, uh, you know, we, we've made a lot of massive strides in preventing ice formation. So, um, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a slew of problems that we need to improve, but um, I, I don't think I'd put ice formation at the top um, of, of, of that list. Some of the more recent data that the, uh, the East Coast started to turn later on, if you want to talk to Ashton or about that, indicate that perhaps ice formation is not enough to problem this person that is uh, more of a recent set of, of work trying to replicate it. It's worth thinking about. Okay. Cool. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you.